All right, Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Good to be in God's house this morning. Um, yeah, I, I um, Brian had uh, informed me last night uh, about Noah, and I just felt so bad for him. I really did. Um, just keep them in your prayers. Um, when our neighbor James died, I think it might have been pretty advanced. I didn't catch it. Um, but when his son Andy caught it, they caught it at an early stage, was able to deal with it. Medical science has come a long way uh, since then, I'm sure, able to do things now that they couldn't do uh, back in the early to mid 70s. And, uh, but again, Christ is the healer. And um, that's what we are. I, I don't pray to doctors, in other words. I mean, I might ask a doctor, doctor, do your best. And I might tell a doctor, doctor, I'm praying for you. But I don't pray to doctors. I pray to the great physician. Amen. And uh, ask him to do his very, very best. Anyway, Revelation chapter 7. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Um, the uh, bunch of ladies got together this last weekend, had a big yard sale. And um, all that stuff is still down there. They're going to do it again this Saturday. So if you want to come and rummage and pillage and sort through a whole bunch of stuff, you're more than welcome to. Next Saturday, I think it starts at 7 a.m. So come on down and um, pick through a bunch of stuff. Some of that stuff is stuff that we pulled out of our house that has been dying to leave our house for years. Just that nobody took it out. So now we had a reason to take it out. So it's gone. Anyway, Revelation 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. We talked about that that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. I mentioned a little bit about that last Sunday um, with King Charles. There has to be a change of the privy seal, um, the official seal of King Charles so that any official document that he signs or anything like that gets a seal. Well, our church has a seal. Uh, I found this in my, in my desk uh, when I first became pastor in 96. I was going through the drawers and they were mostly empty. But I found a little box in there and in that box was a little crimper. And you just put the paper in it and crimp it down and it crimps into the paper the official seal of Bethel Church and um, so anyway uh, and that basically makes that document an official document of Bethel Church okay because we're the only ones in the world there's only one of those seals and we're the only ones that have it um, so anyway, this angel, you could say, is the keeper of the seal of the living God. And when he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now let me, let me just stop right here and, and ask a question that I skipped over last Sunday. Notice that the seal of God is in their foreheads. Can you name something else that goes on people's foreheads in the Bible? 
the mark of the beast. What do you think these two things have in common other than they're a mark on the forehead? What do you wh why do you think that, that God puts his seal, the living God puts his seal in their forehead, and why do you think the beast puts his seal or his mark upon the forehead of basically everybody else. Why do you think that is? Separation? That's not bad. Co yeah, a copycat. It's a false seal. I, it's very possible... Because we know the devil will use scripture against God and God's people. We know that he will. He tried it with Christ. You know, go ahead and jump off this cliff. Because God said he would send his angels down and bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So go ahead and jump. Here, go ahead and handle this rattlesnake. It's like the old boy, they... He went to a went visited a church in, in East Tennessee, didn't know what he's getting himself into. And all of a sudden they pulled out snakes and they handed him one. And he's like, ah, 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 like this. And he's going, Where's your back door? And they said, We don't have one. He said, Where do you want one? <laughs> um turn to uh turn to Deuteronomy six. I think there's a connection here too. But do what the Bible says. Think on these things. Think on them. Think about them. Think of why, why God would do this. Deuteron what did I tell you? Deuteronomy 6. Um, here's what God commanded the Israelites. Um, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt uh, love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And notice this. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Which is right here. Frontlets between thine eyes. So God said, number one, bind it for a sign upon thine hand, and put it as frontlets between thine eyes. Those are the exact two places that the mark of the beast goes is it is bound to the hand and it is in the forehead, literally between their two eyes. Have you ever seen Hindu people from India with a little red dot? Okay, that, that the Hindu word for that thing in their forehead is called a bindi, B-I-N-D-I. And literally, the word bindi means spot. Now, the word spot in the Bible is used often with leprosy. If you have spots on you, the high priest was to check you out and diagnose you with leprosy. If you had, and spots are always a type of sin. If the bride comes in with spots on her dress, is she ready for the wedding? No. Pure religion and undefiled is this, that a man keep himself unspotted from the world. So spots are a picture of sin. And here are the Hindus putting a big spot, which, they, which is literally what they call it, a bindi, which is, means spot. They're putting a spot on their forehead. Uh, Catholics 
every year on Ash Wednesday. What do they do on Ash Wednesday? They put a mark on their forehead. And I'm just going, that's crazy. What are you doing? Because the, the mark, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's called the third eye. You've just opened the pineal gland. Pineal gland is a little gland that's inside the, the center of your brain. And it looks like a little peanut in there. And it literally operates similar to an eye. You know, your eyelids are really thin. And that, there's a reason for that. When you shut your eyes at night and the pineal gland no longer detects light coming in through the eyes, the pineal gland gets activated and it starts releasing melatonin. Melatonin is what makes us start yawning at night. We sit in our chairs and we're maybe reading a book or we're just sitting there relaxing. All start, we start yawning about every 10 minutes. Well, that's because the third eye has said, let's get busy, boys, and release some melatonin. It's time to go to sleep. It's nighttime. And then in the morning, your thin eyelids detect light coming in. That means it's morning time. And that light then is carried to your pineal gland and your pineal gland deactivates. It means it shuts, it shuts off. And it stops releasing melatonin and slowly but surely you start waking up. Now here's the funny part. All of the people in, in the Hindu religion, all of the people in the New Age and the UFO people and all of these crazy people they believe that they must achieve third eye activation. Well, when you activate your third eye, what does it cause you to do? Go to sleep. And isn't that the difference in 1 Thessalonians 5? We're children of the day and not of the night. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. So if we're children of the day, then our pineal gland deactivates and it doesn't send melatonin out and we're awake. But what they want to do is fall into a perpetual sleep, a perpetual state of unconsciousness. And they call that revelation. Okay, that's what they did. They're weird anyway. Uh, but I think, I think Deuteronomy uh, 6 does have something to do with that, with them binding the word of God for a sign upon their hand and uh, let it be as frontlets between thine eyes. You will see uh, Jewish men with what's called a phylactery. They will have a, a box on their head and in that box is contained verses of scripture in Hebrew. They will literally wear that box on their forehead. And again, I mentioned the Catholic Church. Catholic Church says that on Ash Wednesday, you must come and have these ashes drawn on your forehead, and that's the sign that you're being sealed by God. But God never said anything like that. God said that the seal that he puts in them is the seal of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So anyway, uh, let's see here. Back in Revelation 7, um, verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, we were looking at the word seal and sealed and sealing and so on in relation to three things. Number one, seals used by governments to show authority or force of law or a treaty. And in this case, with us accepting the covenant of God, the covenant of God that he has given us is the new covenant. It does not require us to become perfect in our actions. 
perfect in our deeds, self-righteous in any way, because there's not a chance that any of us will ever achieve sinless perfection. It never will. I talked to a man, a guy came to me years ago, and I don't remember how he heard of me. He might have, he might have, this was back when I was doing radio programs for Southwest, uh, not Southwest Radio, uh, the Prophecy Club out of Topeka, Kansas. And I know they had um, radio stations down there that they were broadcasting some of my stuff on. Well, he belonged to a Nazarene church down in Texas. And he was leaving his wife. Now, in the Nazarene church, does anybody know what their major point of doctrine is? The Nazarene church believes that once you are saved, you are brought into a state of sinless perfection, which means that once you're saved, you never, ever sin again. So, with me knowing that, he comes up, wants to talk to me. We're in my office, have the door shut. It's all in confidence. Uh, I couldn't give you the guy's name if I remembered it, but I don't remember it. But anyway, he was an elder, I think, in that church or maybe a deacon. The old pastor, the old man who was still the pastor of that church, he was building his son up to take over the church when the old man retired or if he had a heart attack or age struck him in some way and he couldn't do it anymore. So he was basically building his son up to be the pastor of this church. This pastor's son was visiting, this man who's in my office was visiting his wife on a near regular basis. So while this man went to work, the pastor's son was going over to this man's house. Now, the claim was that they never actually committed the sin of fornication. But they did a lot of romancing, a lot of kissing, and everything that you could do except the act of fornication. That was their story and they were sticking to it. And so the, the deacon, the man whose wife this was, confronted his wife. That was her story. So he takes his story then to the elders and to the pastor and wants to have a meeting about his wife and this man's activities. And I stopped him for a minute I, and I said, what about that doctrine that Church of Nazarene believes that once you're saved, you no longer have a sin nature and you don't sin anymore. And he said, well, let me tell you the dirty little secret. They just say that whatever they did, it's not a sin. Let's see, that's how simple it is. And so after hearing all the things that was said, this little church council declared that since they didn't actually commit the actual sin of fornication, that it wasn't a sin, therefore neither one of them were guilty of anything. The guy went home, packed his stuff up, and said, I'm out of here. He left. He left his wife, left everything, and he drove up this way, stopped here 
to talk to me a little bit. And I said, that all sounds like a great big cover-up to me. He said, you're exactly right. He said, if anybody sins in that church, actually sins in that church, that's what the, in order to protect their doctrine, they'll just cover up the sin and make it into not a sin. And I'm just shaking my head going, that's nuts. That's crazy. Something ain't right with these people. But anyway, so the seal is used by governments to show authority or force of law or a treaty. And it sort of makes me wonder whether these people are actually even sealed or not. If they would go to that extent to lie. See, there was a lot to lose here. The old man, pastor, he's ready to retire. He's just waiting for the son to get to the point where he's confident enough to take over the church. And it's a pretty good sized church, so he's going to inherit a pretty good amount of money. And all of this had to be covered up, swept under the rug, so that this young man could finally take over this church. And that, to me, that... That doesn't sound like it has God's approval stamped on it. Amen. Uh, I think we read this story, Jezebel. This is the story of Jezebel, how she's going to get Naboth's vineyard. She took her husband's seal. Every king had his own seal. Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou not Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal to make it look like, and there, here it is. Remember what we were asking a while ago. What's the di difference between God's seal and the devil's mark? I think that it is a fake seal of God, but just close enough so that people will accept it as the seal of God. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, sent the letters unto the elders, to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. In other words, she's going to nail this guy with letters as if they were from Ahab, but they were not from Ahab. Uh, in Esther chapter 3, this is the, uh, the, the book where if you're reading this, follow the ring. Oftentimes, the king's ring would act as his official seal. He was going to seal a document. They would put sealing wax on it and the king would stick his ring down inside that uh, sealing wax and press it down in there. And because that was the king's seal that had the force of law to it. So then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every prince and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language in the name of King Ahasuerus uh, was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill and to cause to perish all Jews both young and old, little children and women in one day. Even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. What did Hitler do to the Jews before he killed them all? Huh? They got tattoos. What did he do before that? He seized their bank accounts. He sees their bank accounts. He sees their... What are you doing? 
Huh? What? No, you get down in Sunday school. Go, go. I don't love you that much. Anyway, um, they, they, they shut down their shops, stole all their goods, seized their bank accounts, took all their money, and then before putting them into the gas chamber or after, there were men that went around with pliers pulling out all their gold teeth. And when the Americans went through and they started looking in caves that were around the areas because they knew Hitler had stuff hidden in caves, they opened up one vault and found huge crates that were full of Jewish golden teeth. Sickening. Absolutely sickening what they did. But that's what's going on here. The letters, verse 13, the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and took the spoil of them for a prey. So this was going to happen. And this, because Ahab, or not Ahab, but because Ahasuerus, gave Haman his seal, his ring. He said, Haman, from now on, you're acting as if it were my commandment. Whatever you want to do, you can do according to this ring, and you're going to seal whatever it is that you write up. You're going to seal it with my ring, with my seal of authority. But then, King Ahasuerus, later on in the chapter, said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the, the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he has laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. And upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is, in other words, the same day that Haman was going to have all the Jews killed, the copy of the writing for a commandment was uh, to be given in every province, was published unto all the people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. In other words, the king's writing was now reversed and it had his seal of approval on it. Could not be reversed ever. Um... Oh, yeah, I like this one. Daniel 6. This, this has pictures of Christ in it. Daniel 6, 17. Remember in Daniel 6, 17, they're, they're catching um, Daniel praying. And Daniel's enemies, who's made him look bad now all this time because he can reveal Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and he can do all that. And finally, they said, we're going to find a way to get him. Any, anybody will make a decree that anybody who uh, prays in any other God's name gets cast into the lion's den. Now, what they should have added to that was they must be killed in the lion's den. But that's what they left out. Because God is an expert lion tamer. Amen. So they threw Daniel into the lion's den. Next morning, Daniel, is it well? Is it well? And he hears lions in there going. Daniel just stroking their manes, you know. 
The stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed according to or, or concerning Daniel. Nobody's going to change this law. It's like the law of the Medes and the Persians. Once it's written, once it has been sealed, you can't change it. Um, Matthew 26, verse 64. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night. Now, remember what this is about. This shows earthly authority, or it shows authority. And they took a big stone and they rolled it away in front of the, um, the, the cave that Jesus was in, the, the, the crypt. And it was made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In other words, it had the authority of the government. And the government's official position was, this man will never live again. We will make sure it never happens. But it did. Amen? It did. Now, I was going to mention something a while ago, and I forgot about it. If you're sealed by Satan. Is that forever? Is that permanent? Let me get to where I'm going with this. Once you receive the mark of the beast, is there anything that you can do to change that, beg God's forgiveness, have it taken off, and still go to heaven. Who says no? I say no. Because it says, and I don't know the exact verse, Anybody that had the mark of the beast was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, you remember uh, Tim LaHaye wrote the book uh, about the rapture and then he wrote the book about the, the mark and the tribulation and all of those books. Who remembers those books? Okay. One of the books that he wrote was called The Mark. And in The Mark, there's somebody who hasn't taken The Mark and he doesn't really want to, but he gets forced to. They grab him, they tie him up, tie him down to a table, make whatever kind of mark it is they make on a person and they let him go. And now he's doomed forever because he's got the mark. In that book, he's freaking out because I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. They did this to me and I didn't want it. And somebody says to him, well, don't worry about it then. Because God doesn't look on the outside. God looks on the inside. Now, how right is that? I mean, that was true concerning David when God was, you know, informing Samuel on who to pick as king. But does that apply to someone? And by the way, my, my idea about the mark of the beast 
back in Revelation 13 is that the false prophet causes everyone to receive a mark. He does not force them. to. Did the devil force Eve to take a bite of the fruit that she was to not eat from? Did he force her to do it? I'm going to shove it down your throat if you don't eat this. I'll make your life miserable. You'll be begging me for this fruit by the time I'm done with you. Did he do anything like that? No. He simply said, boy, there it is. Look how good it is. Oh, it's going to make you wise. Oh, look how pleasing it is. And she ate. And it was so good to her, she gave it to her husband and he did eat. There was no forcing whatsoever. The devil has never made you sin. And he won't make you receive a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. You're going to want to do this. And once you want to do it, you're going to do it. That's what I believe. So this nonsense about this guy's got the mark and he doesn't want it. Well, God looks on the inside, not on the outside. You have nothing to worry about. But that is not what God says there. He says anybody who's got the mark of the beast, either on the right hand or their forehead, I'm going to cast them in the lake of fire. I'm not going to ask them why they got it. They got it. I'm going to throw them in the lake of fire. So anyway, that's, that's what a seal is all about. It has governmental authority. And anybody who has the mark of the beast will follow the authority of Satan himself. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day you've given us. Father, once again, our hearts, uh, Lord, are leaning toward uh, Brian and Pam and Noah and all their family. And I pray, dear God, that uh, you would give him healing in his body and his bones. God, Lord, that you would even bring him out of the hospital sooner than they thought. Lord, God, that even you would lay your hand of mercy upon him and make the doctors ask the question, we don't know what happened. He had leukemia one day, and now we find no evidence that he has leukemia today. Father, would you do that for your name's sake and your glory's sake. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.